Hi, we're gonna start with the, our next session. Uh, the first one is gonna be uh, Rafael, Mercado. Rafael Mercado. It's gonna present us uh, his work. Uh, he's gonna sharing the screen now, and I'll mute this. Do you see the, the, the screen, the, the presentation? I see. Okay. okay, I'll begin now. Good day, everyone. I'm Bartol Mercado, and I will be presenting paper number 64, Modeling of a Cognitive Hybrid Architecture for the Hydrothermal Regulation of the Room Manipulated by an Agent. The authors are myself and doctors Vianney Munoz and Marco Ramos. We will begin by establishing the context of this research, which is hydrothermal control, that's the control of an environment's temperature and humidity. And as we can see with current events, optimization is growing in importance due to first the trouble with field acquisition, as well as the different societies' attempts at moving into renewable energies. Our approach attempts to implement a cognitive theory to specifically this task. Regarding current approaches to the task of hydrothermal control, uh, this is an active field of research that aims uh, to generate a room environment habitable and comfortable for residents with minimal energy expend expenditure. Examples of approaches are control strategies to actively change a room's hydrothermal state. I think of an HVAC unit or humidifiers and the humidifiers, and that's what we'll be dealing with for this paper. Other approaches include scale management, which is to manage people themselves and spread them out across time so that their body temperature doesn't affect the room or bunch them up together, so it does. And finally, changes to standards and guidelines. This one focuses on changing the guidelines for uh, building for new buildings so that their design is friendlier to the task of hydrothermal control. So we will begin by our interest in cognitive, cognitive theory and cognitive architectures for uh, this task. Since cognitive architectures, biological inspired, helps us to understand our functions as living and thinking beings, they can also be applied to extract and model behaviors for specific tasks. And this is what we will be trying to do for this presentation. We made a cursory search for the cognitive architectures, the ones we list below, and the small facts about them, small characteristics of each one of these that we found interesting for our task. We begin with ACTAR. We, from these, we identify distributed modules that interact through buffers, from SOAR, long term memory is represented as productions, from LIDA, global workspace theory and attention codelets and how they override parts of some of the modules to uh, implement their needs. And quite a little since they handle motivation as a set of internal and external influences. We take these little facts about each one of them and use them for our task. And finally, this one's not a cognitive architecture, but for the sake of space, I place it here. And it's Prims, which is a theory of cognition, where cognitive tests are divided as primitive information processing elements. Our objectives with this study is first to identify cognitive theory for the task of hydrothermal control, implement this theory in an agent, and identify its viability to, to the task. For this study, we propose the following case study 
uh, room's temperature is susceptible to environmental pressure. Uh, the room houses an agent who constantly queries the room's hydrothermal state and can influence the room's hydrothermal state, can actively influence it. This agent has a goal, a goal state for the room, and we begin with each one of these elements. Initially, for the environment and its effects, we used uh, what is it? Uh, data gathered from a weather station located in Toluca, Mexico. We took the average temperature, temperature for, and the humidity for the month of February, and that's figure one, the one you can see to the right. The red line, the red full line, is the temperature, and the dotted line is the humidity. This will be the pressure exerted by the environment and the room we will be modeling. For the uh, yes. For the sake of the future slides, we will be seeing these variables to make it easier to understand. For the room, we have the R variables, T and H. T means temperature and H humidity. And these ones are the room's temperature and humidity. For the agent, we have G and A. G is the agent's goals, and A is the agent's actions. Finally, for the environment, E is the environmental pressure. Uh, I think I'll talk about this later. So basically, the agent's goals, we gathered from information both from the World Health Organization regarding which ranges of temperatures are important for our best for human beings. The other ones are specific to the room we are modeling, the agent sections, and the environment we just talked about. Now, moving on to the room's model. We modeled it as a closed two by two by two space, enclosed by walls of 0.2 meters of thickness of variated concrete blocks. And for the simulation, we use a time step of 10 minutes per tick. With all this information, we made the calculations and ended up with the uh, the equation you can see below for the change in temperature in the room, which handles the room's temperature and the current environmental pressure, as well as the agent sections. For humidity, we used that bit for saturation, saturation, humidity, which means how much water vapor can be contained by the air in given space. Uh, we also constrain humidity since it's a percentage from zero to 100% and 100% meaning the saturation humidity. Finally, we constraining it between those two values, we simply add the agent sections. The agent sections are 11 levels of action for temperature and seven levels of action for humidity. For gravity's sake, I will only say that these values are based on commercial models you find on any market for HVAC units or humidifiers or dehumidifiers. And now we move on to our proposal for the agency interaction with the room. First, every time step, the environment forces some pressure on the room, changing its temperature. In that same time step, the agent queries the room's hydrothermal state. And since that input to the attention module, we will be talking about later, which defines whether or not to engage, rather to engage or disengage with, with each of the elements of temperature or humidity. As a consensus that we will talk about later, this consensus reaches procedural memory that we define as a second module for our agent which generates a plan to be followed by the agent regarding the levels of action we saw a couple slides back for uh, the, the previous slide. This action in turn affects the room's hydrothermal state and we can move on to the next time step 10 minutes later. Now for our attention model, we used as a main reference, the one you can see on top from source regarding he uses it for visual attention. We took the elements that we could include into our current desk. 
uh, which is a subset of the ones he proposed. Now, uh, he, they define multiple mechanisms for selection, suppression, and restriction in their modeling for attention. We take a subset of them and classify them as the four tasks you can see on the image below, which is engaged attention, disengaged attention, handle external or internal factors, and select target of attention. The attention model module receives the hydrothermal state of the room as input, knows the agent's goals and routines, reviews, temperature, and humidity of the room, as well as what happened the previous time step, which is to which is whether it's engaged with temperature, humidity, none, or both. This model works as consensus of the mechanisms regarding temperature and humidity, as we can see in this slide. For the consensus, each of the mechanisms has a vote, which is to engage or disengage attention on the target, according to the lists below. And the sums of votes for engaging or disengaging becomes the consensus and updates the variable of its memory. With this consensus, we then feed the procedural memory module, which we modeled based on a programmer based on L systems, which represents the agent's procedural memory. This grammar produces plans to change the actions of the agent on the room and receives the input, which is the hydrothermal state of the room and the agent's goals, as two parameters, which are, which are the distances between the, our current temperature and the agent's goal temperature, and likewise for humidity. How our proposal works is through precisely a grammar based on those systems. This one consists of a total of four elements. The first one being the alphabet containing terminals and non-terminals. For ease of readability, the terminals are uppercase and the, the terminals are lowercase and the non-terminals uppercase. It also has a set of production rules representing procedural memory with the form you can see right below. And element non-terminal being B, produces uh, an array of elements, terminal or non-terminal, or even epsilon, likewise in B, given two Boolean functions. These functions are dependent on the values of the parameters, which are element sigma of our grammar. And finally, we have an initial non-terminal to begin the whole process. Now, for how we, this grammar flows, we took a bit of inspiration from how Brims handles cognitive tasks, which is to reduce them to primitive elements. Rather than reducing them to primitive elements, we focus each one of our production rules, given their non-terminals, for each one of the tasks. For example, production rules that handle non-terminal T activate when humidity is not being engaged. So they handle only matters of temperature, likewise for A and B. And the contrary happens with H, C, and D. They handle humidity. Uh, now for this module's output, we have ultimately a world composed of terminals, which are A, B, C, and D. The number of appearances of each one of these dictates which level of action the agent will have. A and B dictate an increase slash decrease of temperature. Likewise, C and D for humidity. In this way, we identify which level of action from the levels we explained earlier, the agent will take in the given time step. Now for the results of the simulation, to the left, figure four, you can see, first of all, our model of the room. Since our time step is of 10 minutes, it's easier to, easier to understand how it works. Basically, the room is fully dependent on the environmental pressure and as the temperature of the environment 
reduces, so does the rooms. Likewise, when it increases. To the right on figure five, we can see the this same model, except with the agent's involvement. We see likewise the red line is the temperature of the room. The green dotted line is the environmental pressure. And the blue dotted line is the humidity of the room. We can see from the fear from the first step of the simulation, the agent of the shoots, the activation of its actions. The sapiens because it has no previous recollection of anything that has been happening, so it simply handles the distance. However, once the subreddit happens, it brings it back to its right. The dotted, the shaded area is precisely the ranges that we talked about, the agent's goals. So the agent, once it overshoots, brings it back down and tries to maintain it within the its goal area. Now for humidity, as we I probably didn't say this before. However, humidity in an environment is highly dependent on its temperature. As the temperature increases, there is more capacity for water vapor in the environment. As it decreases, so does the capacity. Thus, whenever big changes in temperature happen, those big changes are also reflected on the humidity. And that's exactly what we can see. Sometimes it shoots up or down. However, it does attempt to maintain it within its whole range. Now, moving on to discussions. Uh, yes, we see that further refinement of actions for actions when the agent is within its whole range can increase the agent's effectiveness. This we can see from, let's say, precisely from the image. Sometimes it just shoots away from its goal because it doesn't really have much control when it's within its goals. Now, also reducing the time step will help reduce the magnitude of the jumps in temperature. Since our model handles the temperature change in intervals of 10 minutes, the first action of the agent has 10 minutes of action on the entire room. If we reduce the time of action, the agent will have more responsiveness to changes. And improvement may be achievable following the Prim's theory's approach to skill transfer. This again, since our first implementation of ideas from Prim's allowed us to make the grammar model, perhaps an expansion of them will help us further. And finally, conclusions. This paper presented a case study to implement elements of cognitive theory to hydrothermal control. The attention model addresses the room's temperature and humidity according to its needs, previous actions, and knowledge. And the procedural memory allows the agents to decide its actions to the environment and their magnitude. Finally, these are the references we used for each of the models and tasks we defined. Now, this is the end of the presentation. Thank you for your attention. If there are any questions, I will be pleased to answer them. Any questions, please? Here's a question. Um, let, let me try to, to explain you my, my question. Uh, <clears throat> when you talk about a cognitive system and we, we think about a cognitive system to solve a problem, uh, usually we, we think that there might be multiple goals, different sets of goals, and then we use a cognitive system because exactly there might be many different goals and then we need to, to first get the goal and then you, you go to, to pursue the goal. But when we are having something like a, a control system where you have just one single goal and the system performs some kind of automatic uh, pursuing it, this, this goal, I, I was just wondering what is the, the benefit of using uh, cognitive theory for solving a problem that you can solve without uh, a, a cognitive system because it can just employ 
uh, rule-based control, what actually appears to be what you have done, because you, you, you are doing a, a rule-based uh, control system for, for controlling this system. So uh, I'd like to, 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 to know what, what, what is the gain of appealing to a cognitive theory for a, a problem that has just one single goal. Yes, that's exactly what I think about this. The reason I decided to start implementing this, since, I mean, this is not an excuse, but I am dealing with different, what would you call it, disciplines. So this is one of my first orients into cognitive theory or cognitive architecture. So that I simply can't apply. What I was thinking about is that if we have, or at least I have, a first step in the subject, now that I know how different elements, different modules, different parts of cognitive theory interact, I can expand on them and I can make it more general, so to speak, so that I can handle the tests. But certainly this is mostly controlled. Any other questions in the Zoom room? Is there any other question? Question? Yes. There is another question. Okay. Um, uh, I, 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 I'm not sure what I am going to say, uh, but um, uh, have you heard about the Internet of the Things? I have. Yes? Okay. So imagine that you have a um, cognitive architecture uh, controlling an IoT environment. So what, um, what kind of control do you need uh, for this problem, for IoT? Do you think it is possible to use uh, a cognitive architecture to control um, all the needs or problems that arise in an IoT environment? Or no? Or is uh, is a huge uh, solution for a small problem? Well, yeah. Sorry. Well, uh, well, that's also part of what I started thinking about cognitive theory. Certainly, I've been to some of these talks, and that cognitive architectures are certainly a big element, or are big, are capable of many tasks, many general tasks. Well, if we wish to implement them to simpler tasks, in the same way that I presented here, at least what I think how it would work is by taking sections of them, taking what we need from them and implement them to the task at hand. For Internet of Things, I am not certain what, what the meaning of managing Internet of Things is. If you could give me a, an idea of what that means. Well, imagine that you have a, a security problem in in, in that environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what kind of uh, functions, cognitive functions, do you need to solve that problem of security, human security? Human security. Okay. Well, first of all, it's based on what I know, what little I know about it. But initially, attention is an obvious one to know when something is wrong with a person. Then the different elements of memory, to it could be to know what each person is predisposed to. And followed with knowledge from what we know about people's health, for example, or the social situation of a given area, as well as something that allows us to make plans with that regard. It could be 
Yeah. For yeah. So, so so different. Uh, Thank you. So different cognitive functions uh, must um, be activated yes. depending on the problem that you have. Okay, there are some uh, cognitive architectures like a CSP that allow uh, to 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 configure to create a specific uh, um, uh, set of of uh, cognitive function to solve a problem, yeah? So I think uh, this is, as, as you say, is your first uh, step uh, into cognitive uh, architectures, but um, I think it is not uh, too bad, okay? It's my point of view, obviously. Thank you, we, we don't have any more time for for questions, we're going to proceed with the schedule.